Hello and welcome to tonight's lecture, arranged by the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies in partnership with Usul Academy. I'm your host, Naim Mahmoud. Tonight, we are to have the sixth lecture on the series, Decolonizing Social Sciences from Uniplexity to Multiplexity. This is a seven part lecture series that is taking place on a fortnightly basis. The series aims to understand contemporary social sciences in light of fifth. The title of tonight's lecture is Studying Human Action, Fiqh and the Sao. The lecturer is Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantur, who is a distinguished lecturer and a scholar in this field. Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantur is a professor of sociology at Ibn Khaldun University, Turkey. He served as the founding president of Ibn Khaldun University from 2017 to 2021. He was a researcher at the Center for Islamic Studies in Istanbul and the founding director of Alliance of Civilization Institute. He is the head of International Ibn Khaldun Society. He published widely in English, Arabic, and Turkish on a whole range of topics, including social theory and methods, civilization, modernization, sociology of religion, networks of Hadith transmission, Malcolm X, Islam, and human rights, modern Turkish thoughts, and Ibn Khaldun. He also authored several books that have been translated into Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish. A few words about the format of tonight's lecture. We started with a brief introduction. The lecture will be next, which will last around 30 to 45 minutes. The lecture will be then followed by comments and Q&A section, which will last around 30 to 45 minutes as well. We observe few rules. We ask our audience to keep mic and mobile muted until told otherwise. We encourage questions and discussions maintaining professional approach. We also encourage attendees to take notes on the lecture for the comments and Q&A section. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantur to deliver the lecture. Professor, over to you. Hey, uh, Salam Alaikum, uh, everyone uh, from Istanbul. Uh, I wish all of you uh, good health. Uh, uh, this, in this lecture, I will be uh, talking about studying uh, human action, fukuh, and uh, tasawwuf. This is the uh, uh, sixth lecture, lecture uh, in the series of decolonizing social sciences from uniplexity to uh, multiplexity. And uh, uh, in this lecture, uh, I will uh, talk about the uh, Islamic approach uh, the multiplex uh, Islamic approach to uh, human action, which is represented by fukuh and tasawuf, and they complement uh, each other. Uh, so our conception of the human being is very fundamental to our study of uh, human action. What's the human action as an ontological question? So there are uh, many uh, perspectives but mainly there is materialist perspective, idealist perspective, and the multiplex uh, answer. So who is the human being? Are we just thrown into this world and abandoned by God, as Martin Heidegger claimed? Or as Taha Abdurrahman declares, are we ethically responsible beings who flourish in the unseen world as much as in the here and now? So you see that there are uh, very different uh, views uh, regarding to this uh, very fundamental uh, question. Building upon this fundamental question, we will make an introduction to Fuku and Tasawwuf and explain how they study the outer and observable dimension of human uh, behavior. So uh, who is the human uh, being that Fuku studies? or what's a human being according to uh, the discipline of uh, Fuku. Behind any systematic effort to study human action, there are at least a couple of presumptions concerning the human being per se and his actions. These presumptions are so important that they change the overall meaning, structure, and aim of the social scientific endeavor. So your view on a uh, human being and your view on human action shape the, uh, the structure of uh, social science. One of the most important factors that makes the difference between social science and fukuh is 
understanding who the human being is. The social sciences conceptualize the human being within the material environment of the biosphere. So this is what uh, Sullivan uh, wrote. Uh, the human being and his life are void of any meaning other than the fact that he is living on earth. He is ontologically disconnected from God and alienated from anything that he is not experiencing from other levels of existence. The human being, according to Foucault, on the other hand, is self-reflexive and relational. He is an interconnected being. Human existence takes place at many levels. So when we say interconnected, he is connected to God, he is connected to the metaphysical world, he is connected to the physical world, he is connected to the social world. I mean, there is no uh, level of existence with which human beings are not uh, connected. Uh, so they don't live uh, on the uh, biosphere. You know, they don't. They are not only earthly uh, beings, uh, but they also have connections to the metaphysical world and the divine world. Uh, uh, the epistemology of Foucault reaches to divine revelation, which provides an answer to the question of who is the human being. So we have already uh, talked about the Islamic uh, ontology, epistemology, uh, this uh, multiplex understanding of existence and multiplex understanding of uh, sources of knowledge. Now we are building, you know, step by step. Uh, now we are talking about uh, the Islam's approach to uh, human being and his uh, action. Uh, for Fikr, the human being is a connected and interconnected creature, while for the social sciences, man is disconnected. One of the most important issues about the self in the modern approach is its disconnection with the transcendent, where it actually finds a fundamental meaning. So it disconnected from the uh, metaphysical and transcendental levels of uh, existence from modern materialist, uh, secularist uh, perspective. But uh, Taha Abdurrahman, who is a, a Moroccan uh, philosopher, uh, he, uh, uh, he's one of the great minds uh, Muslims uh, produced in the 20th and 21st century. So he wrote, the Islamic method governing modern differentiation rests on a fundamental fact, namely the human is originally a connected or interconnected creature, ka'in mutasim. It is in the nature of humans to even connect with world beyond time and space, the metaphysical world which is what we call spirituality. And no matter how sophisticated science may be, the spiritual realm cannot be diminished by new scientific discoveries. It is no wonder then that the disconnected man, Al-Insan Al-Munfasil of Western modernity finds the world to have lost all meaning, precisely because he has been disconnected from the world's secrets and wondrous workings. The consequences of men losing confidence in the world have been immensely destructive. This disconnection has, in addition, led to the emergence of the phenomenon of extreme fear of death, because for this man, there is nothing that lies beyond this world. Uh, uh, so human being as the addressee of teklif. Uh, addressee here means mukhatab muhatab of teklif. Uh, so Allah speaks to every human being. So uh, every human being is addressed by a uh, human being uh, because Allah Ta'ala gives commands, responsibilities, and rights to every uh, human being. So every human being in fiqh is uh, considered uh, an addressee of God. Because God speaks to every human being, man, woman, rich, poor, black, white, uh, all of them, uh, to uh, explain to them their, uh, their duties. And at the same time, God listens to all human beings when they uh, pray uh, to him. So there is a direct communication between God and uh, human beings. Uh, 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 to all human beings, regardless of uh, who they are. According to further conception of human being, we all have God-given rights and responsibilities. Uh, 
Uh, as an Arabic term, teklif literally means the imposition of a task and entrusting a duty to someone. In fiqh, it uh, denotes the legal and ethical responsibility that an agent is required to uh, undertake. So every human being is called uh, mukallaf in uh, fiqh and mukhatab uh, of the uh, teklif uh, according to divine law. Uh, Allah Ta'ala outlines uh, the duties and rights of every uh, human being. And the purpose of this uh, explanation is to make social world harmonious with the natural world. You know, make human action in harmony with the rest of the universe. Otherwise, uh, if uh, human action is guided uh, with uh, an ideology in, con in contradiction with God's will, uh, which uh, regulates the whole universe, then there will be disharmony or even conflict with the order in the whole uh, universe. Uh, so that's why the order in the universe and the order of social life and the personal life, uh, if they are uh, regulated, organized, according to the will of the creator of the universe, then uh, they will be uh, uh, harmonious. Uh, what's the relevance of teklif for the society for the study of society uh, teklifs as i have uh, mentioned you know uh, a requirement uh, by uh, allah ta'ala uh, and uh, every human being according to fuku is called mukallaf that means you know someone who has responsibilities and uh, duties uh, and rights uh, so the concept of teklif provides the meaning and context of human life on earth in which their actions have a meaning so this is what they uh, reject. For this, there is no teklif. You know, uh, God does not assign any responsibility, any right uh, to uh, human beings. He doesn't speak to uh, human beings. Uh, uh, and human beings cannot speak to God. So there is, you know, uh, absence of uh, communication between God and uh, humanity, according to uh, this. Uh, uh, but from an Islamic perspective, and also from the perspective of all uh, religions sent by God, you know, uh, there is a constant communication between God uh, and uh, uh, every individual uh, human being and uh, society. And this is the meaning of teklif. Uh, so building on this concept of teklif, the whole spectrum of human conduct is governed by ilm al and categorized according to its conformity to divine law under at least five major groups. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, human actions uh, uh, fall in one of these uh, categories, wajib, compulsory, mendu, praiseworthy, muba, permitted, uh, or uh, neutral, uh, mekru, disliked, haram, uh, forbidden. Uh, so, there is no uh, human action which is outside these uh, categories. Uh, and here you see a multi-valued logic is used, uh, as I have explained in my previous uh, lectures. Uh, these are called af'al al-mukallafin, that means actions of the uh, mukallafs, uh, the responsible uh, people, the acts of the legally and ethically responsible persons. Uh, the responsibilities of human beings cover four major areas, responsibilities towards God, responsibilities towards his own self and responsibility for society and responsibility towards nature because as i have mentioned a human being is a relational uh, being uh, so we have relations with god relations on our, our own self with society and nature uh, zimma is an attribute of human being so what's zimma it literally means covenants assurance security, safety, sanctity, and right and responsibility. Uh, so every human being has a zimma. Uh, every human being has a covenant with God. You know, uh, every human being has security, safety, sanctity, rights, and responsibilities. That's the meaning of uh, zimma. Uh, in usul al uh, zimma expresses an attribute by which a person becomes eligible for possession of rights and responsibilities. 
through zimma, an individual becomes accountable, not only legally, but also religiously and morally. So uh, Fuku uh, accepts that every human being has zimma, uh, capability to have rights and uh, duties. That's the meaning of uh, zimma. Uh, the Quran mentions two transcendent bases of the self, the covenant of man before coming to the world and emana, trust, which is given to mankind in order to be fulfilled in the world. Uh, based upon these two occasions, Islamic tradition propounds the notion of zimma in order to conceptualize the human self in the context of rights and responsibilities. Zimma links the self to the transcendence and elucidates the self within different time levels. Zimma makes sense of the self starting with the creation of man and his covenant before coming uh, to this world. So the notions of uh, al-isma and adamiya and human rights. So these are key terms in uh, fiqh. One needs to uh, you know, uh, familiarize himself or herself with these terms to better understand uh, what fiqh is about. Uh, so a legal maxim in Islamic law states, the right to inviolability is due for humanity. So isma means the right to inviolability, that every human being has right to uh, inviolability simply uh, for being a uh, human. Uh, so ademiyya means humanity. Uh, uh, so uh, every uh, person who has the quality of ademiyya has the right to isma, which is the right to inviolability, inviolability of life, inviolability of uh, uh, mind, inviolability of property, dignity, family. Uh, so uh, this is for every uh, human being. So this shows that Islamic law uh, or fiqh has a universal approach. Uh, so fiqh studies uh, actions and relations of all human beings, not just Muslims, all human beings, the Ademiyya. Okay, so this is very important to know because we have misconceptions about fiqh today. We have a very narrow understanding of uh, fiqh. And, uh, and my purpose by bringing in these things to, uh, to, to correct these uh, misunderstandings about uh, fiqh. Uh, so basically, uh, fiqh is about the study of the ademiyin, uh, all human beings, and their rights and duties and their relations. Uh, for Fuku, all human beings, regardless of their race and religion, have rights just because they are born as human beings, just because they are children of Adam. This approach is called Ademiyya or humanity uh, principle. Ademiyya, humanity, is the ground for universal human rights in Islam because every person who has the quality of Ademiyya, you know, has right to inviolability of life, property, religion, family, dignity, uh, as I have uh, mentioned. Uh, so this right to inviolability includes inviolability of life, property, religion, mind, freedom of expression, family, and honor, dignity. Uh, these are the uh, fundamental universal rights recognized by uh, Fuku uh, as God-given, born, inalienable rights. Uh, I mean, we have already discussed these things in detail in my previous uh, lectures, especially when we discussed Islam as an open uh, civilization, this universalistic approach uh, to uh, human rights uh, based on uh, Ademiyya. Thus, simply being human is sufficient to possess human rights, regardless of the innate, inherited, and gained attributes such as sex, religion, race, and nationality. Uh, all Hanafi jurists uphold this uh, perspective, as well as uh, uh, Maliki, Hanbali uh, jurists. Uh, I mean, we have discussed these things in detail in my previous lectures, but here I am bringing up this. Uh, why? Just to show you the universal approach of uh, fukh as a uh, discipline. Uh, 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 the, in social sciences, there are three uh, approaches to uh, uh, individual uh, human beings. 
so they may be called personalism, individualism, or uh, collectivism. Uh, 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 so uh, human beings, as I have mentioned, uh, relational uh, creatures, they have relationship with God, with other people, and their own selves. Uh, so these three approaches, individualism, collectivism, and personalism, is about this uh, relationship. So Foucault's approach is neither purely individualistic nor collectivist, but it may be called uh, personalistic. This is what uh, Lawrence Rosen uh, calls in uh, the book uh, titled The Justice of uh, Islam. So uh, personalism uh, accepts that the, the individual is an interdependent being having intrinsic relationships with others such as God and other people. Uh, it emphasizes the significance, uniqueness, and inviolability of the person, as well as the person's essentially relational and social dimension. Uh, how about individualist? So the, from the perspective of individualism, the individual life belongs to him, and that he has an inalienable right to live to live uh, his life as he wishes, to act on his own judgment, to keep and use the product of his effort, and to pursue the values of his choosing. This is the individualist uh, perspective to a human being. How about the collectivist, uh, who are the opponents of uh, individualism? So they argue that the, the individual's life belongs not to him, but to the group or society of which he is merely a part, that he has no rights, and that he must sacrifice his values and goals for the group's greater good. Uh, so you are nothing as an individual. What counts is society. The individual is of value only in so far as he serves the group. So you see that there's a false dichotomy between individualism and collectivism, and the Islamic uh, view is a kind of middle way a balanced uh, perspective, bringing together uh, you know, these two uh, perspectives. On the one hand, recognizing the uh, individual uh, autonomy of the individual, but within the context of uh, society uh, in relations with uh, others. Uh, so this is what Lawrence uh, Rosen calls personalism, as opposed to individualism and uh, collectivism. Uh, so what's uh, human action and how can it be explained? Uh, so, uh, I mean, our uh, concept of human being is very important uh, because it really shapes our concept of human uh, action. So human action is the intentional performance of an act. So if an action is not intentional, it is not considered an act. Uh, so intention is very uh, important. You know, it must be based on will and intention. Human action is a joint production of soul, mind, and body. Because uh, as I have uh, uh, presented before, uh, we accept that a human being is constituted by soul, mind, and body. You know, uh, so, uh, and, uh, and a human uh, action is a co-production of our soul, mind, and body together. Uh, but materialists focus only on body, uh, let's say in medical science, you know, when there's a problem, they want to uh, treat human being only just the body, you know, uh, they ignore mind and soul. This is a big problem in uh, medical science. Uh, uh, a holistic approach is needed in uh, medical science uh, to uh, come up with uh, truly effective uh, 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 treatments. Uh, for human uh, illnesses, uh, uh, and same with uh, you know uh, social sciences. Uh, so the materialist focus only on the body, the idealist focus only on the mind. So according to materialist, human action is a product of uh, human body. According to idealist, human action is a product of human mind. But uh, from the multiplex perspective, human action is a product of soul, mind, and body. They all work together. Uh, in, uh, uh, in collaboration with each other. So human action, according to Muslim scholars, has two levels, external and internal. So that's another major difference between the 
modern and postmodern approaches to human action. Uh, so, uh, like first major difference is about the uh, source of uh, human action. Second, uh, it's about the external and internal multiplex perspective to uh, human action, because the existing modern or postmodern perspectives they focus either on the external or the internal dimension of human action. So the levels of self, narrative and nefs, uh, are the key to understand and explain human action as there is a causal relationship between intentions and actions. Uh, so if you accept that uh, human beings is considered by visible physical uh, dimension as well as invisible mind and soul, then uh, human action also has these two uh, levels. Uh, so the internal level uh, of uh, human action is performed by the spiritual heart, and it's studied by Tasawuf, and the external level of human action is produced by human body, and it's studied by uh, Fukur. So you see that uh, the levels of human uh, ontology is reflected on the levels of uh, human uh, action. Uh, how does Fikr study human action? Uh, Usul al-Fikr as a method uh, studies uh, human action. The majority of contemporary studies exclusively focus on the statistical facts in the explanation of human action and society. Usul al-Fikr, on the other hand, as the common methodology of all Islamic disciplines allows the utilization of tools for both descriptive and normative study of human action. Moreover, unlike positivist approaches, Usul al-Fakr does not assume a differentiation between these two modes of analysis. Thus, its method of studying human behavior and society allows in various uh, sources or evidence, edilla, which include God's word, reason, society, and the individual self. So it's not a uh, reduction. It's the, so in order to utilize these sources, a plurality of methods must be used. Uh, so you see here that the norms uh, and the uh, uh, you know, norms in Fukuh, they are uh, universal, but at the same time relative. There are universal norms and relative norms in uh, Fukuh. And the sources of norms you know, uh, God, you know, a source of uh, norm uh, through divine revelation and messenger of God and the sacred books and human reason is also a source of norms. Society is another source of norms and individual self is also a source of norms. Uh, in Fukuh, you see, uh, Fukuh does not rely only on Wahi, only on Quran, only on Sunnah. Fukuh has multiple uh, uh, sources. I mean, human reason is a source, society is another source, individual self is another source, and the norms that are produced uh, by Fukuh, sometimes universal, sometimes uh, relative. And, uh, and these norms uh, is about the relationships of an actor, uh, a human being, with society, with nature, and God. Uh, so this is a summary of the logic of Fukuh, the structure of uh, Fukuh. And uh, so let me present to you a case study about how uh, Fukuh approaches, you know, uh, human uh, actions. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, you want to make an inquiry on a medical issue. It is necessary to evaluate both medical evidence and the textual evidence simultaneously. You know, uh, there is evidence-based evidence, evidence -based medicine, but Fukuh is also evidence-based. Uh, uh, so you have to bring together evidence-based medicine and evidence-based Fukuh uh, together on a medical uh, issue. Uh, because it's a medical issue, you have to uh, uh, operate both uh, Fukuh and medicine uh, together uh, at the same time. Uh, however, its implementation requires an intricate method because both legal and medical evidence are fluid, not solid. In other words, their degree of certainty is variable. 
so in evidence-based uh, medicine, the uh, levels uh, of the certainty of the evidence changes from uh, A, B, C, D, depending on uh, how much it is tested, how much uh, it is uh, studied, and how many cases used to uh, support it. Uh, uh, so if it's tested on, on a few people, it's like level D. But if it's tested on, let's say, tens of thousands of people all over the world, then it is uh, level A uh, evidence. Uh, and the same thing in uh, FUKU, you know, uh, because the, in FUKU, the level of the uh, certainty of uh, uh, evidence uh, changes uh, 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 depending on the uh, depending on the authenticity as well as the uh, uh, indication uh, of the uh, evidence they said you are using quran or hadith you know uh, uh, so uh, uh, i mean quran is 100% uh, certain with respect to the authenticity but uh, there may be uncertainty regarding uh, indication of the verse in the quran but in hadith, uh, the issue of certainty and uncertainty emerges regarding uh, the authenticity of hadith as well as the indication uh, of the hadith. So it's a really uh, complicated uh, uh, methodology uh, to study uh, a medical uh, issue. So here, you know, this uh, uh, matrix shows uh, that the uh, you know, here you have medical evidence. It may be level A, level B, level C, level D. And then you have uh, fuku evidence. And then fuku evidence, you know, uh, cut E and zanni. Uh, Q means cut E. Uh, Z means zanni. Uh, uh, because uh, fuku evidence, as I have mentioned, uh, uh, studied from authenticity perspective as well as indication perspective uh, so if an evidence from quran or sunnah is uh, certain uh, both uh, uh, with respect to its transmission as well as its indication then it's 100 percent certain but uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, perfectly authentic but indication is zanni so uh, this is the matrix you get at the end uh, so let me explain the first uh, uh, one. So if medical evidence from level A and evidence from uh, uh, FUKU also level A, so both are certain, 100%, then you produce a certain norm, okay? But uh, uh, let's say uh, here, uh, uh, medical evidence is level A, but uh, FUKU evidence, zanni zanni. You know, uh, authenticity is zanni, and indication is zanni. Then uh, uh, this rule is not binding because it's not uh, certain. Uh, I mean, so it's an example of uh, how complicated the Fuku methodology when it comes to studying uh, issues uh, in uh, medical domain. But uh, this perspective is applicable to economic domain, political domain, as well as other. Uh, domains. So FUKU brings together empirical research on human actions as well as the uh, normative uh, 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 approach uh, together and study uh, together. Uh, I have an article on this, a long article explaining this issue in uh, detail, but I just put it here as, a, as an example uh, to uh, demonstrate to you how FUKU incorporates empirical perspective in its uh, studies. Fuku is not only abstract study of uh, human action. Uh, so the, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, Fuku uh, studies human uh, actions, all human actions are studied by uh, Fuku. And, uh, uh, but when we say Fuku, uh, I mean, uh, I don't mean the narrow uh, understanding of Fuku uh, today. Uh, I mean the uh, Fuku uh, 
as understood by Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ghazali, all these great uh, scholars, which is very comprehensive. Uh, so the, the, their understanding of fiqh brought together fiqh al-batin, fiqh al-usul al-fiqh, fiqh al-akbar, and furu al-fiqh. These are the things that we have uh, discussed in our uh, previous uh, lectures. Uh, so they study ibadat, you know, uh, devotional practices. They are about man to God relationship. And then mu'amalat, these are about interpersonal actions and social uh, uh, relations, uh, uh, transactions. Uh, they are called mu'amalat, man-to-man relationships and uh, activities. Under that, there is a fiqhul munakihat. It's about uh, family and uh, 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 marital uh, issues. And then fiqhul uh, mu'amalat, it's about commercial issues, you know, transactions. And ukubat, they are about uh, justice and uh, penal law, and they are all about political life, economic life, and social life. These are all studied by uh, fiqh, because sometimes people misunderstand fiqh narrowly. It's as if it's only about like how to make wudu and how to make salat and how to fast. Just the contrary, you know, uh, fiqh is a science of civilization. Fiqh is a science of society in general. And nothing about the human being is outside the domain of uh, fukh. Uh, but fukh studies the external, visible uh, dimensions of uh, human action. Uh, and also fukh studies uh, human action at the micro level and also at the macro level. I mean, the actions of the individual as well as the actions of the uh, group and society even international relations uh, between uh, states. Uh, uh, so I have to skip this because uh, we are running out of time and this may take a long time to uh, explain. All right. Uh, so how about Tasawu? So Tasawu, uh, also known as uh, Sufism, but I don't like this uh, you know, uh, term Sufism because it uh, looks like an uh, ideology or uh, philosophical uh, current uh, today, like an ism. <laughs> it's not ism, uh, actually. You know, I think uh, we should use uh, original Arabic terms. Uh, so tasawuf is a discipline by which we know the states of the soul or the spiritual heart, praised and reprehensible, and the ways to purify it from the blameworthy qualities and to beautify it with praiseworthy attributes. Why do we need to do this? To change human action. Because uh, human action originates uh, in the heart of a human being. So if you purify the heart, actions uh, will also become corrected and uh, reformed. Uh, 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 so it's also called fiqh uh, you know, inner uh, fiqh uh, or the spiritual uh, fiqh. So from this perspective, you know, fiqh has two branches. Fiqh zahir, you know, concerning the outer dimension of human action, and fiqh batin or tasawuf, concerning the inner dimensions of uh, human uh, action. Uh, so the subject matter of tasawuf is actions of the heart, af'alul kulub, in terms of purifying, uh, purifying it from blameworthy uh, attributes. So tasawuf, is about actions of the heart, intentions, uh, and attributes uh, of the heart. Uh, so the sources of tasawuf are the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, uh, th three disciplines uh, emerged from the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, Aqidah and Kalam, Fiqh and Tasawuf. Aqidah and Kalam studies faith, uh, articles uh, of faith. Uh, iman and uh, fiqh studies amel but the external dimension of amel and tasawuf studies internal dimensions of uh, amel human action so these three disciplines uh, emerged from the quran and uh, the sunnah because in the quran and sunnah they are all together uh, but scholars turn them into separate disciplines by classifying the material they gathered from the quran so like, uh, you know, issues about faith, they put them together, made the discipline of Aqid and Kalam, 
and the issues about uh, human action, relations, rights, duties, you know, transactions, punishments. They brought them together, made the discipline of fiqh, and the issues in the Quran and the Sunnah about spirituality, inner life, actions of the heart, intentions, uh, attributes uh, of a uh, heart. So they brought them together and made the discipline of tasawwuf. So these three disciplines, kalam, fiqh, and tasawwuf, emerged from the Quran and uh, the uh, Sunnah. Uh, so what's the purpose of tasawwuf? The purpose of tasawwuf is to elevate the human being to the pinnacle of noble contact, uh, noble conduct and character or spiritual chivalry, which is called futuwa. Futuwa was a common term uh, in the Muslim world in all Islamic languages, like Arabic, Turkish, Persian, Urdu, in all these languages. But unfortunately, it's forgotten uh, today. Uh, so uh, we need to like revive it. Uh, so the purpose of uh, Tasawuf is to teach people this highest level of morality and ethics, which is called Futuwa. Futuwa literally means uh, youth uh, ethics, youth ethics. Uh, uh, so that's the, the purpose of uh, Tasawuf, uh, reforming human beings so that they become moral, uh, ethical human beings at the highest uh, level. This may be comparable to the concept of praxis, which means an action or engagement that seeks to create change. Futuwa is characterized by complete and continuous piety and sincerity, ikhlas. And, uh, so every action in Tasawuf must be based on ikhlas. So, I mean, uh, uh, acting uh, in a nice way is not enough. This good action must be based on good intention. Uh, so good intention in the heart and good action is uh, in the body. Uh, so they must coordinate uh, together. So ikhlas and amal must be uh, together because uh, 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 a good deed without ikhlas behind it is useless. Uh, so some of the Futuva principles bring the joy into the lives of your friends and meet their needs. So this is what's called ithar or altruism, other, otherishness. So Futuva ethics, which is taught by Tasawuf, is altruistic, otherish, not selfish, not egoist, just opposite. Uh, uh, and this ethics, you know, is taken from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Respond the cruelty with kindness and do not punish for an error. Do not find fault with food offered to you. Keep your friends' interest at heart and care for your neighbors. Invite guests, offer feast and be hospitable. Be truthful. Instead of seeking the faults of others, look at your own faults. Be satisfied with little for yourself and wish wish much for uh, others. So these are some of the principles uh, of Futuwa. And the first book about Futuwa was written by uh, Abu Abdurrahman ibn al-Hussein al-Sulami 1,000 years ago. And, uh, of course, before him, people wrote and talked about Futuwa in the Quran and in the Sunnah, but he dedicated an independent book to the uh, issue of uh, Futuwa. So this is the uh, first book on Futuwa. And I believe uh, uh, the book I wrote on Futuwe, which is published last year, is the last one. <laughs> so, you know, there's first book by Ibra, uh, uh, as, by as Sulami, and the last book by uh, Recep Şentür on uh, Futuwe. And uh, I wrote the book in Turkish. And now, uh, mashallah, you know, uh, young people are very much interested in reading it. And it's translated to English also. And soon it will be published, uh, inshallah, by Usul Academy Press. Uh, we, we are now uh, working on it, and it will be the first book of Usul Academy Press, uh, inshallah. So the uh, purpose of uh, Tasawuf is to teach people Futuwa ethics derived or grounded on the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Uh, uh, and the Tasawuf. Uh, the purpose of tasawwuf is purifying the heart. And in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَغَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And by the human self, 
and how it's perfected in proportion. Then he inspired it with discernment of its wickedness and its righteousness. Successful indeed is the one who purifies it. You know, successful is the one who purifies the hearts. You know, uh, and indeed, failed is the one who corrupts it. So how do you purify your heart? You know, Tasawuf answered this question. You know, uh, that's the purpose of uh, Tasawuf. Uh, uh, because from the perspective of Tasawuf, what it is, is not the same as what it ought to be. But from the perspective of uh, social sciences, you know, what it is, is the same as what it ought to be, because they take it as human nature. But uh, Tasawuf and Islam does not take uh, what it is uh, as what it ought to be. Uh, in a, we don't uh, uh, take uh, what we observe or what majority of people do as human nature uh, maybe they are doing it, uh, you know, for some wrong uh, reason. Uh, so Ghazali classified uh, nature into two groups. So first group, perfectly created, and there is no room to improve it. But human beings, they are not, uh, 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 they are not uh, uh, pre-programmed perfectly. You know, they have to perfect themselves. You know, uh, perfect their morality. I mean, they are physically perfect. But morality, they have to learn it. Ethics, they have to learn it. Religion, they have to learn it to become perfect human being. Uh, so they have to uh, claim you know, to be an ideal, perfect uh, human being. Uh, so human beings, they are not uh, pre-programmed you know, uh, completely. They need to uh, develop themselves through uh, education and uh, training. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so there are like a, the different views on what uh, it is and what uh, ought to be with respect to human uh, action, human uh, ethics. So modernists, they argue that what it is is equal to what ought to be. And this is the positivist conception of social sciences. They make surveys. They look at the majority. If the majority is doing something, OK, this is human nature. This is uh, what they uh, see. Uh, for the, from the pursuit of postmodernists, there is no is and there is no ought. We cannot say anything about you know, what a human being is or what a human being ought to be. You know, they deny uh, these things uh, in reaction to uh, modernists. But from a multiplex uh, perspective, what it is is not the same as what ought to be. You know, this is a critical perspective, be critical approach to society. Even majority you know, uh, does something, it may be wrong. Uh, so uh, in order to study this, uh, we developed uh, a discipline. It's called uh, Hikmah uh, Ameliyah. And one has to learn Tedbirul Nefs, Tedbirul Manzil, and Tedbirul Medina, managing the self, managing the household, and managing the uh, city uh, to improve them, to bring them to the level of what they ought to be. And what they ought to be must be based on justice. Justice at the individual level, justice at the family level, and justice at the city uh, level. So according to uh, Tasawuf, uh, a human being is constituted by soul, mind, and body. Uh, so the soul is constituted by two elements, two faculties, uh, reason and self, the uh, hedonistic self, or in Arabic, akal and nefs. And they are in uh, constant uh, conflict with uh, each other. Uh, so these are the two faculties uh, of the soul. So tasawuf is mostly uh, focused on the soul, the inner life inner conflicts, uh, inner actions of uh, a human being, in particular the heart uh, and the conflict of akal and nefs in the heart, their uh, relationship with uh, each other. And the ultimate goal is to make uh, akal the king or the ruler of our inner life. Uh, 
and establish justice and balance and harmony inside of us. That's the purpose of uh, Tasawo. So from this perspective, uh, from the perspective of Tasawo, there are uh, three types of self. So uh, type one self, type two self, and type three self. In the type one self, nefs is dominant, akal is subjugated. In the type three self, akal is dominant, nefs is subjugated uh, to it. So the ultimate goal of tasawuf education or tasawuf training is to elevate a person from type one self to type three self. Uh, but there is a transitional stage. And in the transitional stage, you know, uh, there is uh, a conflict going on between uh, akal and nefs. Neither one is uh, uh, permanently dominant. So sometimes, you know, one acts according to the uh, dictates of uh, akal, uh, uh, and sometimes one acts according to dictates of the nefs. Uh, uh, so uh, in tasawuf, this is called the siyasetul kal, politics of the heart. You know, in politics, there are opposing uh, powers, and you have to control them. And uh, and the and the righteous one uh, must be the ruling uh, power. Uh, 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 so, the, from this perspective, reason akal should be the king, the ruler, uh, and the nefs should be the servant of the uh, of of, of akal. Uh, but in type one self. You know, uh, akal is the servant, and hedonistic self is the king, the ruler. Uh, so, so type one self is called nefs amara, uh, and the type two self is called a nefs al levame, and type three self is called the content self, and nefs al mutmainne. So, mod modernist and postmodernist they accept type one self as natural. You know, they think this is human nature, but this is not true. You know, uh, from Sufi perspective, uh, human nature is reflected in type three self, you know, uh, uh, in which reason is the uh, dominant power and uh, nefs, passions, desires are subjugated to it, and uh, uh, only then one becomes content and uh, happy. Uh, and uh, as I said, the goal of uh, Tasawuf education is to elevate a person from type one to type three uh, self. Uh, um, uh, uh, depending on the uh, type of the self one has, uh, his attributes and his actions change. In, a, uh, uh, in type one self, you know, people swing between extremes, you know, either coward or aggressive, you know, either stingy or extravagant. You know, uh, but uh, type three self uh, 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 reflects the golden mean. Uh, so courage is between cowardness and aggression. Generosity is between stinginess and extravagance. Uh, so this balance, the goal of uh, Tasawuf education is to create this balance between the two uh, extremes, al and uh, this is how uh, a person become happy. Yeah, the purpose of Islam and the purpose of fiqh and the purpose of tasawwuf to make a person happy in this world and in the next one. That's the ultimate goal. And what kind of inner life you need to have in order to become happy? You uh, need to have a balanced life you know, uh, between the extremes. Then you become uh, happy. That's the answer of uh, tasawwuf. But materialists, they say, you know, uh, just uh, go to the uh, go to the uh, direction of the material desires, and those uh, idealists, uh, you know, Christians, uh, you know, Buddhists, Hindus, they say, you know, completely kill your uh, uh, desires. But Islam establishes this uh, balance uh, between them. All right. Uh, uh, so, how does Tasawwuf study human action? from a multiplex uh, perspective. Uh, from this perspective, the ultimate control center of a human being is the soul, which is also called the heart and the self. 
Okay, so the ultimate control center is not the brain, as we are taught you know, from a materialist perspective. It is our soul. It is our spiritual heart. You know, it is above the brain. You know, the brain controls the body, but the brain is controlled by soul, by spiritual heart. Many social theorists agree that intentions determine human behavior while they neglect what motivates the intentions. Okay, what's the origin of intentions? Where do we get the intentions from? So this is what they neglect, but Tasso goes deeper, you know, studies the origins and the sources of intentions. So the heart is the knowing, deciding and acting human agency. The body and limbs are just tools of the heart. They are instruments of the heart. What moves the heart to act is the khawatir, ideas emerging in the heart. The source of actions are khawatir, writes Ghazali. So uh, the, those khawatir, the ideas that come to heart, you know, they turn into desire, desires turn into determination, determination turns into intention, intention turns into will, and this will is communicated through brain to the body, and the body acts accordingly. So this is the process through which an action is produced according to uh, Tasawu. Uh, so how does the type uh, of self affect the behavior? As I have uh, 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 mentioned, uh, the type of self one has, whether nefs amare or levame or mutmainne, shapes his or her uh, behaviors, actions, relations uh, in uh, practice. Uh, uh, so the purpose of studying the heart is not to understand its true nature or essence, because this is something impossible. You cannot understand the essence of the soul, but to grasp its attributes and changing states. But, but you can study changes, changing states of the soul, but not the essence of the soul. So the soul is hidden in itself. It belongs to the metaphysical world but it, it is manifest in its actions on the body, which uses it as a tool to exercise its will. So the dominant faculty in the heart, either the reason or the ego, determines the state of the heart. The state of one's heart determines his intentions. One's intentions determine his actions. Uh, so you see, this is the chain of uh, causality. So in conclusion, multiplex human ontology and self offer an alternative model to explain human action based on the following premises. Human ontology is multiplex body, mind, and soul. The completion and perfection of a human being take place not only in the mind, but also in the heart uh, and manifest in behaviors. The self is multiplex, so is human action is uh, multiplex. So the self you know, uh, has three types, ruling, appetitive self, critical self, and the content self. Nefs Amara, Nefs Lewame, and Nefs Mutmainne. So the ideal mental spiritual state is the content self, which we call a Nefs Al Mutmainne. Uh, so there are things that are not complete and perfect like nature and beings that are created to accept perfection like human being and society. I, I'm sorry, there are things that are perfect and uh, they don't accept any improvement like nature, uh, you know, but human beings, uh, they accept more perfection, you know, through uh, education. Pure observation of society might not provide proper explanation of social laws and norms since what is happening in society is not necessarily that ought to be. So you cannot rely on the statistical majority to decide what's right and wrong. This requires a critical engagement with social phenomena while calling forth a project of regulating the society in order to turn what is into what ought to be perfection of what was not complete and perfect before. Uh, so uh, a good example of... Uh, uh, Sufi is Mevlana Jalatun Rumi, you know, uh, so these are some examples, uh, you know, uh, and this is the shrine of uh, Rumi in the city of uh, Konya, and uh, uh, this, uh, this was the uh, Sufi lodge in uh, Istanbul, in Yenikapu uh, Mevlevi Hanesi, uh, and let me finish with a citation from Rumi, 
So he said, knock, and he'll open the door, vanish, and he'll make you shine like the sun, fall, and he'll raise you to the heavens, become nothing, and he'll turn you into everything. Okay, uh, my dear uh, friends, so we stop here. This is the end of my presentation. Now I am happy to hear your suggestions, questions, objections, uh, contributions. It's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it has been a very enlightening uh, lecture, of course. Um, again, we thank you uh, for the lecture and presentation. And uh, we hope our audience have taken notes on it and uh, are prepared for the, uh, for the session of Q&A. Um, just today, everyone know that would be focused on the uh, content of the lecture only so um, please do make sure that you raise your hands if you have any questions to ask directly to professor also you can uh, let us know your question in the chat as well and uh, so um, Robert could you uh, let us know as well if there is any any hands raised or if there is any question uh, from the audience uh, Professor, I'd like to start with uh, one of the questions uh, of mine. I, I guess that will give our audience a bit of room to uh, sort out to their questions as well. Tasawf seems to seems to be a very um, a methodological uh, approach to correct human actions. It has uh, quite a lot of things uh, that can that can change a human being from inside out. Uh, I mean, this has uh, so much potential to offer and uh, so much things are there. But uh, as, as, as you said, that it is the, um, the study of soul and uh, it, what it does is it beautifies the soul, it purifies the soul and uh, it does so just to correct the human actions, right? So from inside out, it wants to correct our, make ourselves a better human being at the end of the day. But, uh, there has been a huge misunderstanding about Tasawf in the Muslim world. You know, it looks like, like you know, they, 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 from my perspective, you know, what I have seen, that they connected with Sufism all the time, and there's some negative connotation with Tasawf and Sufism. I mean, how do you see it? I mean, uh, is that is, is is that been Tasawf has been really appreciated by the Muslim world at the moment, or is it's a bit not that much? Yeah, uh, well, that misconception, you think? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a very important uh, question. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, uh, Tasawuf has a critical approach to uh, uh, human uh, behavior, actions, and relations in order to reform it, correct it, improve it. But in order to be able to do this, you have to first understand what's human action, what are the source of human action. Okay, so Tasawuf does this. Uh, so he ha Tasawuf has a, a theory of human action. Like uh, what's human action? What are the cause of human action? And how does it emerge? Uh, uh, so there is a theory of uh, human action, but behind this, uh, you know, as a foundation, there is a theory of uh, human being. What's a human being? Okay, so you know these are all connected with each other. So uh, uh, and uh, from this uh, 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 approach, fuku, kalam, and tasawuf they complement each other. You know, from a multiplex uh, perspective, they complement each other. So fuku studies the external dimensions of human action, while uh, tasawuf studies the internal dimension of uh, human uh, action. So you need to first understand you know, uh, what uh, human action is about. Then how to reform it, how to change it, how to educate it, you know, how to correct it. Uh, what are the methods uh, for this? You know, then uh, comes this as, the, as a second uh, step. And also in order to be able to do this, you need to have an ideal human being. You know, uh, uh, so you need to set an ideal for human beings so that you elevate them to this level. And this ideal is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, okay? So the purpose of tasawwuf is to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallam externally and internally and elevate human beings 
you know, to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah both in their uh, physical actions uh, and in their uh, inner uh, actions, inner life uh, as well. Because uh, uh, Islam has outer and inner dimension. Sunnah has outer and inner dimension. So you need fiqh and tasawwuf to collaborate together uh, to understand both uh, dimensions and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and reform them and uh, uh, correct them. So you need ikhlas, which is the uh, focus of tasawwuf, and you need amal, which is focus of fiqh. And ikhlas and amal must be together. If there is amal, practice without purity of intention, this amal is useless. Yeah, you know, uh, and uh, you have ikhlas, good heart, good intentions, but no practice, this also useless. You need to bring them uh, together. That's why tasawwuf and fiqh, they complement each other. And traditionally, they have been taught together. You know, kalam, uh, fiqh and tasawwuf, they were taught together from a multiplex perspective. And unfortunately, in the 20th century, you know, uh, some people started, you know, denying uh, kalam. Some people started rejecting tasawwuf, you know. <laughs> so they destroyed this uh, multiplex uh, perspective. They made uh, Islamic knowledge very superficial, you know, uh, very superficial. No, no spirituality, no uh, inner uh, uh, understanding, you know, uh, of Islam, and then no philosophical uh, dimension. So they they rejected the philosophical dimension and they rejected the spiritual dimension. Then what are we left for? Left with just the legalistic, uh, you know, uh, do's and don'ts. This is not Islam. You know, uh, Islam is not a law. Islam is a deen. Islam is a deen. And look at the life of Rasulullah. Look at the Sunnah. Look at the Quran. You see that there is a deep philosophy, deep spirituality, as well as this uh, deep normativity uh, of the uh, physical uh, actions, social relations. Uh, you know, so I mean, uh, we need to revive uh, this. Bring philosophical depth with the spiritual depth uh, together and combine them. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, you know, this survives in Turkey, Alhamdulillah, you know, uh, but in some countries, you know, they made a big mistake by rejecting philosophy and rejecting tasawwuf. Now they cannot resist against modernity and postmodernity because they have no deep, deep thinking. You know, how can you uh, resist uh, postmodern thought or modern thought if you have no kalam, no philosophy, no tasawwuf, you have only very superficial understanding of Islam, you know, very legalistic, dry uh, understanding. How can you oppose those trends? You know, uh, so basically they undermine their own uh, religion, but uh, they were, uh, you know, illusioned, you know, to have a pure Islam. You know, uh, and they thought uh, tasawwuf doesn't belong to Islam, kalam philosophy doesn't belong to Islam. All what we need is just rules, do's and don'ts. You know, this is a very simple, very superficial understanding of uh, of religion, and also it's a treason to our intellectual tradition. It's a treason, you know, to uh, our multiplex, sophisticated, holistic uh, uh, civilization and uh, you know intellectual uh, tradition. So we need to revive this, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, 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 and uh, I, I recently see that. You know, they are also disillusioned from this uh, superficial understanding of Islam. Now they are searching for alternatives. <laughs> but some of them, they leave Islam and they go to the Western side. They become atheists. Hafaz uh, and Allah. You know, uh, uh, and uh, unless you bring in this philosophical and spiritual depth, depth, you know, depth, you, know, uh, you cannot protect your youth uh, from getting uh, deceived uh, by these, you know, uh, modern and postmodern uh, 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 you know, uh, attractive uh, uh, philosophies uh, and currents. Uh. So uh, thank you so much, Professor, for that uh, elaborated answer. Uh, I'll go to the uh, questions at the chat session in a minute, but uh, I've got, got another questions for you, question for you, which is, do you think the modernity and the colonial uh, period to do the time of colonial era in the Muslim land, they have 
kind of destroyed the spiritual part of Islamic education. And uh, their emphasis was uh, more of a kind of structural level, as you said. Islam is all about superficial because we, if we look at the leadership in the more in the uh, in the Muslim land, uh, uh, and their ethics, their manners, and their attitude in most cases is materialistic. I mean, there's yes. uh, hardly any, uh, there is hardly any space for spirituality, you know, uh, kind of stuff there. So there's a huge lack of that kind of um, spirituality overall. So mm. do you, do you, do you blame modernity for that? Do you blame any uh, Western discourse or their approach and their you yeah. know, handling with Islamic education kind of stuff? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, the imperialists, the colonizers, they uh, should be blamed, you know, for many of the wrong things, you know, that are taking place in the Muslim world. But primarily, we should blame ourselves why we were allowed, you know, why we allowed ourselves to be deceived, to be fooled, to be manipulated by them. We should be smarter, you know, uh, to protect ourselves, <laughs> you know, uh, and not allow ourselves to be manipulated, you know, uh, misguided uh, uh, by them. Uh, so uh, let's put the uh, blame first on ourselves, then on colonizers uh, and the, you know, uh, the imperialist uh, uh, and orientalist uh, and enemies of Islam. And as uh, Malik bin Nabi says, if there is a society uh, ripe, you know, uh, ready to be colonized, there will come some people to colonize them. You know, uh, so we should have been like more alert uh, to this. So uh, even today, you know, uh, I mean, uh, like we do, uh, uh, you know, many mistakes, uh, and uh, you know, we need uh, some kind of nefs uh, lewame, the critical self, you know, uh, you know, uh, self blaming, uh, you know, uh, approach uh, to uh, uh, our our own mistakes. So that we can correct it and move on, rather than putting the blame on others. Uh, That's very interesting. So you want us to look at ourselves rather than looking outside, blame other other yes. people and other civilizations or yes, yes. Other, so I other, say, other I always say what matters is what we do, not what others do. Okay. So look at what you do. This is what matters most. You know, uh, very interesting. Know. Yeah. Very important. Let's go to, um, I think we have a hand raised over there. Um, could you please uh, uh, unmute yourself and raise the question, please? Hi, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, uh, wa yeah, My name is Dunya, uh, and I just uh, joined the lecture I was listening in. Um, I was kind of laughing just now when you were describing uh, how people you know, come from a very uh, legalistic and very like black and white kind of deen. I would say like, I was kind of from those people. Um, like when I was first introduced to Islam, my first journey to Islam, when I started practicing, I came from, like I was in that kind, I was in that exposure. So it was very, very like rules, rules, rules. I didn't have any spirituality. It was just like, you know, religious, and I was just, I didn't understand any of my worship, you know, I didn't have my heart in my worship, I was just like so scared, and so fearful of Allah that I just did all of my duties, you know, so I've just been recently following and, and opening myself up to other lectures and other people talking about Islam, uh, and I find so much more peace in it, um, so I just wanted to ask you, Professor, like, what advice do you have for me, um, considering I'm new on this journey and I'm just exploring and, um, yeah, basically, what, what advice do you have for me? Yeah, I mean, my advice to you, have this multiplex perspective, the balance between philosophical dimension, legal dimension, and the spiritual dimension, okay? So we cannot sacrifice do's and don'ts, don'ts. You know, I mean, they have very important role to play, and nor can we sacrifice the spiritual dimension. You know, uh, nor can we sacrifice the the uh, the, the philosophical uh, uh, dimension, uh, because traditionally, as I have mentioned in my lecture, like uh, Muslims develop these three disciplines: kalam, you know, uh, which is theology, philosophy, and uh, fiqh. 
you know, which is, uh, you know, roughly translated as Islamic law, which is not the precise translation, and then the tasawwuf. So you need to bring them uh, together uh, in, your, in your life from a holistic uh, perspective, uh, because uh, sometimes people focus only on spirituality. They neglect uh, rules and norms. This is also wrong. You know, uh, it's just tasawwuf and uh, purity of the heart, uh, good intentions. You know, I mean, our ultimate uh, role model is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Follow his sunnah, and, uh, and all these disciplines, kalam, fiqh, tasawwuf, all of them, is to help you better understand the Quran, better understand the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and put them in uh, practice. Uh, and but you may not be. Uh, uh, able to do these things uh, alone by yourself, you know, uh, you may need like a guidance and help of a scholar or somebody who knows these things, you know, to help you gradually uh, learn these things, you know, uh, in order without overburdening uh, yourself and enjoying uh, your journey. Islam is fun, you know, Islam is cheerful. You know, uh, Islam, as I have mentioned, you know, is given to us to make us happy, not to torture us, not to make our life uh, boring. You know, uh, I mean, uh, Islam is the most fun thing, uh, you know, uh, in the world, uh, if you properly understand and if you properly uh, practice it. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 may Allah help you and give you best success. Uh, to learn it in a balanced way uh, and enjoy it. Uh, Islam has halawa, the taste, you know, uh, halawa to iman, the pleasure of iman. You know, may Allah help all of us to experience the halawa to uh, iman uh, in a hadith. Uh, Prophet Muhammad said, you know, uh, iman has halawa, pleasure, taste. You know, this is one of the things we lost. Uh, you know, uh, during modernization and westernization of our understanding of religion and uh, turning religion into something legalistic uh, only. So we need to bring in uh, this, uh, this uh, spiritual joy uh, and the pleasure uh, dimension uh, of Islam as it's mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the Hadith and in the Quran, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, you are welcome. Okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, right. Now, if you go to the chat, we see um, we have Sophia uh, commented and actually uh, made a question. She said, to Futua ethics similar to uh, Nicomantian ethics? Is Futua ethics similar to that? Um, Is Futua uh, ethics similar to Nicomantian ethics? Or something? Sophia? Uh, so where is this? Uh, let me check the uh, chat to be able to find it. Uh, yeah, if you go at the top. At the, the top? Yeah, not at the, uh, the middle, actually, if you just uh, scroll down a bit. Um, um, I, uh, could you please, okay, be, uh, I yeah. could not locate it. Uh, what's I, the question? Can yeah, I, yeah. I slowly come? Uh, Please have, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I was just wondering if it's similar to Nicomachean ethics or um, what is the difference? Hmm. Uh, uh, there are similarities. Yeah. There are similarities uh, because uh, uh, akhlaq or ethics uh, yeah. has been taught by messengers of Allah all over the world. Yes. That's why, you know, humanity shares common ethical values. Mm. Like you have ethical values the same in Japan and in America, in Africa, Latin America, everywhere. Yes. Uh, and they, because they have like a same origin, which is a uh, divine revelation. Mm. Uh, and uh, like a samurai culture is the same with Futuwa and chivalry is the same with Futuwa uh, and Nicomachean ethics also, you know, many similarities. Mm. Uh, and uh, so uh, because of this uh, common divine origin, there are many similarities in like Muslim ethics and, and ethics taught by Greek philosophers like Aristotle yes. and in, in Japan, you know, uh, Shinto, you know, uh, it's because of this. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with this. I mean, uh, we are very happy to see that uh, 
you know, uh, many people in the world and in history shared the values Prophet Muhammad taught. Because Prophet Muhammad did not say, I brought to you something completely new. Yes. That yeah. To confirm the teachings of the previous masters. Mm. Uh, because from Adam salam, up until today. So there is nothing wrong, you know, if you see uh, commonness or similarity between the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad wasalam, and teachings of our scholars with previous philosophers, mm. previous uh, religious masters from Japan to India to China. Like, uh, I mean, you read Confucius, very similar to Sunni, right? Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bushido, very similar to Futuwe, and in Africa, same things. Uh, uh, and this is clearly mentioned in the Quran. Musa de Kalima Ben Yedehi. You know, uh, you know, in the Quran, it says you know, to confirm, to confirm mm -hmm. uh, what uh, was brought uh, before you. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is not surprising uh, for us. And as uh, as Muslims, we have been open you know, mm -hmm. to teachings, uh, you know, or the philosophy of Greeks. You know, uh, Persian, Indian, mm. uh, as long as you know they overlap with our own uh, teachings, and there is no reason to reject them or uh, deny them. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, there is a question actually uh, in, a, in the chat which says that the uh, self. I mean, there is a self-help industry. We know that. And um, that talks a lot about personal development and how to bring out the best from oneself. But uh, um, but can that be uh, tasawf? Can uh, tasawf be you know used in that case? And uh, you know, can it uh, do that kind of job? You know, in in helping us out, uh, bring out the best to be best in this world and hereafter. Yes, of course. Uh, this is the purpose of our religion. You know, uh, like, uh, and our religion, in order to improve, uh, you know, uh, human beings, educate them, train them, you know, make them uh, better human beings, has tools. Like a uh, kalam is one tool, fiqh is another tool, tasawuf is another tool. You know, uh, these tools uh, are derived, you know, uh, from the Quran and Sunnah. They originate from Quran and Sunnah. As I said, you know, scholars classified material depending on the subject. You know, uh, so uh, so these tools, uh, all of them must be used uh, together from a multiplex perspective. You cannot rely only on tasawuf. You know, you cannot rely only on fiqh. You cannot rely only on kalam. You have to use all of them together uh, to better understand the Quran and Sunnah and put it in uh, practice. Uh, uh, so tasawuf alone cannot be sufficient. You know. Uh, 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 for us, uh, we have to use all of them, and uh, and actually in this uh, modern and postmodern world, uh, there is no other way, you know, to protect yourself from this, you know, uh, uh, from this, uh, you know, uh, uh, devious uh, 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 currents, which is very confusing and misleading. You know, uh, I mean, these are just illusions, you know, and people are kind of, you know, uh, captured, <laughs> captivated, you know, by the uh, attractive uh, discourse produced uh, by them. And, uh, and you cannot protect yourself uh, from these uh, uh, discourses, except, you know, you rely on uh, these uh, disciplines uh, and learn deeply Kalam, Fuku, and Tasawuf, all of them uh, together, as well as how they were implemented in our history. Uh, otherwise, you, you know, uh, you cannot resist, uh, and our youth cannot resist, you know, this these strong uh, confusing currents. Uh. Oh, yeah, there's related questions uh, as well. I mean, how does a modern person navigate uh, to Tassau, for example? We know uh, our education uh, is quite different uh, than what Tassau actually teaches us. So how could a person start? Where should a person start? How can he start the journey? What do you, what do you suggest? Where can yes. someone start? I mean, uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, traditionally, all Islamic disciplines, they were taught by uh, teachers, 
both kalam, fukuh, tasawuf, you know, we had like education institutions, the madrasa, the Sufi lodge, you know, like we had institutions, you know, to properly uh, teach things. Uh, but unfortunately, today we don't have those uh, institutions. And, uh, you know, there are some uh, charlatans, you know, uh, who abuse, you know, tasawuf and, uh, you know, they are merchants, you know, who try to make money <laughs> or like pursue their, uh, you know, personal interest by using uh, Islam and in particular tasawuf, you know, because uh, this Sufi thing, you know, like uh, very folkloric and very interesting in, in this postmodern, like new age stuff, etc. You know, uh, they try to turn tasawuf into a profitable, uh, you know, uh, feel good uh, business, <laughs> you know, uh, so one has to protect himself, you know, from falling prey uh, to these merchants, uh, uh, you know, they are businessmen rather than like a real uh, Sufi sheikh or a scholar of uh, Islam. Uh, but uh, these wrong examples should not uh, uh, blind us from seeing the truth of the matter. I mean, now, you know, we have charlatan uh, medical doctors, we have charlatan businessmen, we have charlatan, you know, politicians, but we don't ignore, you know, these domains completely, you know, uh, so there is like bad and good in every domain. So in the domain of Tasawwuf also is the same, and you have to be careful. And our ultimate criteria is the Quran and the Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah, you know, uh, of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why I emphasize that you keep kalam, fukuh, and tasawuf together. You know, if you just focus on tasawuf, you can, you may easily be get misguided, you know, and deceived. <laughs> you, know, you know, you have to keep the aqidah intact, amel intact, and then tasawuf. Uh, and a true master of tasawuf, a true scholar of Islam, always keeps these three uh, together in the service of Quran and Sunnah. You know, not disconnected uh, uh, from them. Uh, uh, so you need to find like uh, someone who can educate to give guidance, you know, in these uh, issues uh, to learn. Uh, because as I said, we don't have the well-established institutions uh, today in these uh, areas, and you have to be careful, you know, uh, against those uh, charlatans, you know. Thank you, Professor. We're nearly at the end of the uh, uh, session tonight. Um, if anyone has any specific questions, uh, could you please uh, raise your hand? And then I think we'll be able to uh, uh, take that and uh, uh, take it to Professor. J just before that, Professor, I I'd like to, you know, I have a kind of fascination uh, with regard to that um, Sufi dance in Turkey and uh, Konya that you, uh, you know, that we can normally see when we talk about uh, Sufism at Tasawuf, we see the, you know, the uh, dancing, um, whirling, uh, uh, um, long, long um, hat uh, mm -hmm. people over there. You, you, you talked about following the uh, tradition of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So one can definitely pose that question: that how much this practice, Sufi practice, is related to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and mm -hmm. how does uh, how authenticated is that methodology? Mm -hmm. uh, in in understanding in, in enlightening ourselves and uh, bringing ourselves you know in, in, a, in, in a in a traditional prophetic uh, way mm -hmm. yes uh, i mean uh, like i was in konya you know uh, and some people said today we have a sufi show <laughs> we'll go there i said what kind of show sufi show <laughs> so like you know uh, i mean uh, as i mentioned you know those uh, charlatans they turned everything into business, you know, uh, mm. so they make money, you know, out of like a Sufi shows, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so you have to be very careful uh, about these things, you know, and this has nothing to do with the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, uh, I mean, in, uh, like uh, people may have like different uh, uh, practices of Zikr, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, if they are based on authentic Sunnah, they say, okay, this is coming from the Sunnah, but uh, sometimes it's not based on the authentic Sunnah, uh, and they never claim, like a true Sufis, they never claim this is taken from the Sunnah. They say, we just do it this way, you know, uh, but if they claim uh, that it is a new uh, form of worship, this would be haram, you know, because uh, you know, the forms of worship are set by Allah Ta'ala in the Quran and by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Sunnah. 
So no one can innovate a new form of worship, right? Exactly. I mean, but you know, people can do it, uh, you know, by themselves without claiming, without claiming. It's very important that this is a new form of uh, Sunnah. Like you know, I mean, if you are a teacher, you can make like a you know a, a, like a play in the school with the students, uh, you know, making some zikr, saying things, you know, without claiming, okay, this is taken from the Sunnah or from the Quran. It's okay. I mean, uh, uh, but if you claim this is the Sunnah or this is Fard, you know, uh, you know, uh, everyone must do this way, then it becomes bid'ah and uh, it is rejected. Uh, of course, there are many people, you know, uh, who do lots of bit of things uh, under the name of tasawuf, you know, uh, and real uh, Sufis, they are very critical of them and they reject those uh, practices. Like you read Imam Ghazali, you know, like he's very critical of the Sufis who are involved in bid'a, and uh, like Imam uh, Rabbani, Esther Hindi, you know, and many other Sufis even uh, today, you know, they are very critical. So tas re re true tasawuf is based on the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. You know, we don't need like a fabricated uh, superstitious things, you know, uh, to practice our uh, religion. Authentic Sunnah is enough for us. Uh, mm -hmm. See what I mean? Uh, and those, uh, like there are some practices, if they don't claim this is Sunnah, then it's okay. They can do it, no problem. Like they can have mevlid. They can have like a different. But is, is, is that not innovation? Is that not innovation in ibadah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. As long as they say it's not uh, ibadah, you know, uh, you know, because if they say this is a new form ibadah, well, very dangerous. See what I mean? But if say we, we are just doing this, you know, just to remind ourselves, you know, God and praising Prophet Muhammad, etc. You know, uh, without claiming it's a new form of ibadah, it's okay. They can do it, no problem. This is okay. the Sharia yeah. rule. Excellent, excellent. Uh, it actually it cleared my mind uh, uh, very, very clear, very nicely. So you have uh, Tanvir and uh, Rubaya. Rubaya will come to you. Let's let's uh, go to Tanvir now. And Tanvir, could you unmute yourself please and make your question quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Right, I can't hear, hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a problem in the audio. Maybe we start with Rubaiyat. Uh, okay, Tanvi, do one thing. Could you um, join again, please? Okay. And uh, I think that will help. Uh, Actually, uh, I see in the chat that Tanvi wrote uh, his uh, questions in the chat. So he has that like uh, some Sufis disagree with uh, Fakis, which one should be followed. Actually, uh, true Sufis and true Fakis, they never disagree with each other. You know, like Imam Ghazali is a Faki and Sufi, right? You know, like our uh, scholars, great scholars, you know, they combine the spiritual aspect with the formal uh, aspect, you know, uh, and uh, uh, so if there is a disagreement, that means, you know, uh, either one of them is wrong, you know, uh, or they don't understand the uh, issue uh, at all. Uh, so better to stay away and find somebody who combines Fuki and Tasawuf uh, together, you know. Uh, so Fuki and Tasawuf must be together, you know. Uh, they cannot be separated from each other. Uh, as I have uh, made this point very clear in my presentation, that uh, they complement each other. One focuses on ikhlas, intentions, inner feelings, you know, inner life of a Muslim, and the uh, other focuses on the external uh, uh, dimensions of human action and relations and the legal, ethical dimensions of it. So they combine each other. And uh, if some people, you know, created a conflict between them, that means they don't understand the system. <laughs> You know, uh, there's a problem because look at Rasulullah He was the most spiritual man, but at the same time, he followed the rules. You know, he combined, as I said, you know, fuqa and tasawwuf. These are tools to educate us to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah in a very authentic way. I mean, uh, so how can they conflict with each other? 
<laughs> See what I mean? So if they are conflict, that means you know those people who represent Fuku or Tasawuf, you know they are uh, they have some problem, you know, in their approach. Uh, so stay away from those kind of people. Go and find somebody who combines, you know, true Fuku and true Tasawuf uh, together, and helps you better understand inner and outer dimensions of the Quran and the Sunnah and put it in uh, practice. So this is what a real scholar uh, does. Uh, and this yeah, is your question about uh, fena and baka. Fena means cleaning yourself from everything disliked by Allah Ta'ala. You know, uh, cleaning your inner self, you know, from everything disliked by Allah Ta'ala. And when you clear your inner self, you know, uh, your outer uh, actions are also cleared from those wrong things. And Becca means installing or cultivating everything that's liked by Allah Ta'ala, that's pleasing uh, to uh, Allah Ta'ala. That's the meaning of uh, Baka. Very simple. You know, staying away from anything wrong. This is Fana. And practicing everything that's right and pleasing to Allah Ta'ala, that's Baka. But doing it in a permanent uh, way. You know, uh, not just uh, you know, you do uh, not just once in a while, in a permanent way, like really internalizing these attributes uh, in yourself. You know, uh, then this is called fena and uh, baka. Uh, so cleaning and ornamenting. So cleaning comes before ornamenting. Cleaning is called fena. This is the stage of la. You know, then comes baka. This is the stage of illa. You know, the negation, then confirmation. Uh, so may Allah give you best yes. success, Tanbir, in uh, doing fana and baka, bi'iznillah ta'ala, and all of us. I think, <laughs> and all of us. I think Tanbir has got his uh, questions. Rubeya, uh, uh, next, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, I had uh, a question about the, uh, uh, um, actually, uh, my question would start with an observation. The observation is that even in uh, circles, where the sawwuf and fiqh are important. Uh, sometimes uh, aqidah and admul kalam are not given that kind of importance. And uh, for, uh, like we've, we've seen, like I, I agree with you and a lot of uh, scholars would agree with you uh, who are like traditionally trained in, in the Islamic Sharia, you know, they would maybe like, you know, from, from my context, like there, there's this issue that uh, Aqid and Elm al-Kalam are not developed as they were developed before, right? Like before you would read multiple books in, in uh, you know, logic and, you know, uh, Kalam and stuff. So um, from where I'm coming from, the dominant tradition, even though it respects that tradition, there seems to be a waning in the education of uh, uh, Mantek and Kalam and, you know, so... So, I mean, what's your role? Like, I, we have taken a view that it's actually, uh, in, in our day and age, it's, um, it's actually necessary and essential to study uh, Kalam and philosophy. Yes. Because I think, I think the Ayatikadi issues that develop uh, individually yes. and collectively, I don't think they will be addressed if you do not have, you have fit and possible, very, very strong fit and possible, very beautiful, like, you know, uh, people with excellent adab and excellent, mm -hmm. but like, when, when it comes to like, uh, responding mm -hmm. to the etherazat of the, uh, you know, of, of, of people who do not believe in Islam. Yes, yes. yes. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely, uh, I completely agree with you. And then, you know, I make the same observation as well. So like, uh, you know, I see that uh, even those like traditional madrasas, they uh, drop Sheikh uh, al-Aqaid. They read something very simple, like Fukul Akbar or Tahawi, very simple, yani, uh, and there is no argumentation, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, no kalam, no mantik. So they drop akliyat. And I think this is under the influence of the, uh, those like uh, literalist uh, uh, perspectives, you know, uh, coming uh, from uh, some of the Arab countries, you know, uh, and uh, I unfortunately observe this in India also, like those in the Darsi Nizami programs, they are dropping Akliyat, which is wrong, you know, uh, so they are dropping Aliyat, like Sarf, Nahiv, Balaga, and they're dropping Akliyat, you know, like Mantuk, Kalam, Falsafa, Hikmet, 
you know, uh, so this is a distortion of the uh, intellectual tradition of Islam, and this is treason, you know, in my view. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, you know, uh, in Turkey, you know, uh, the institutions I established, Alhamdulillah, they maintain this tradition. And my Sheikh, Alhamdulillah, he taught me like everything in a balanced way, you know, akliyat, aliyat, and also fiqh and tasawwuf and hadith, like all of them uh, together, Alhamdulillah. And uh, those uh, Darul Ulooms, they were like this, but they are corrupting, you know, uh, their uh, system. You know, uh, oh, Sheikhul Akai, Taftazani, too much, very complicated. You know, just read the uh, Tahawi, you know, Metnul, Ak Metnul Akaid for Nesafi, that's uh, sufficient. Uh, uh, so this is very superficial, you know, uh, uh, but then uh, those students who are educated this way, uh, they cannot penetrate uh, in those uh, you know, uh, philosophical issues raised by modernists and postmodernists. See what I mean? Uh, so like, uh, you know, Sherhul Akkad begins, there is truth, there is truth. And like some people think, why waste your time proving that there is truth? But now we are postmodernist. Exactly. Are there, there's no truth. See, you know, how important it is. This is the karamet of those ulama, you know, who started the Akida book with this uh, sentence as the first thing. Then you need to read Sherhul Akkad to equip the student so when he comes across with such a claim, oh, he's ready, he's immunized. He has all the arguments to refute it. Uh, and the same way, well, ilmu biha muthakkibun. You know, we can know reality. There is reality and we can know reality. So if they come across with an agnostic, they have all the uh, edilla, all the arguments to argue uh, against it. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, now, you know, we follow this uh, in uh, Usul uh, Academy. Usul academic curriculum, you know, uh, is the uh, is the is very loyal, you know, uh, to the traditional Islamic uh, teaching, uh, and my education, you know, in the West, in America, in the Western world, is like sociological, modern philosophy, etc. You know, it made me better understand the logic of our traditional educational system. It's very sophisticated, very complicated, but you know, a superficial approach doesn't understand, appreciate, like why these uh, elements are there. So they say, oh, more mantic, logic, useless. We don't need logic. Come on, <laughs> you need logic. You know, they say, we don't need all these philosophical discussions. They are useless. No, no, no. You, you need all these you know, uh, philosophical uh, discussions. Uh, uh, and uh, I just gave the example uh, for them. So we should never uh, abolish aliyat and also akliyat. Like with respect to aliyat, like uh, sarf nahim balaga, you know, I, I, I learned importance of balaga in Masjid Nebawi. You know, I also wow. used to think, I also used to think that like uh, too much uh, uh, time is wasted, you know, teaching students this aliyat, sarf nahim and balaga. You know, I was thinking our scholars, teachers exaggerate. But when I was in Medina, there was a preacher, you know, reading a poem and making takfir of the poet. Because the poet says, oh, Muhammad, you are the light of our hearts. And the sheikh was saying, see, he said light. Prophet Muhammad is not light. He's human being. <laughs> He's kafir. <laughs> you know, you know so far, I said, there I understood importance of balaga yeah, like literary arts you know uh, figurative speech me metaphorical speech and all uh, all uh, students of islamic disciplines must learn balaga so that you know they 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 wouldn't uh, you know become like this sheikh you know uh, you know because the, the, the poet doesn't mean he's really light you know uh, he means something else but this guy it seems he did not study majaz he did not study kinaya <laughs> Subhanallah. So, Alhamdulillah, you know, we are maintaining this approach in Usul Academy. Uh, and inshallah, our students will learn uh, both Aliyat and Akliyat. And actually, graduates of uh, uh, some of those schools, they come to Usul Academy, we tell them, you, you have already studied, you have completed your Islamic education, but they say, we have never learned Akliyat and Aliyat. So we need uh, these things. 
but also we uh, bring in this empirical dimension, the social sciences, you know, this comparative uh, and critical approach to uh, social sciences, uh, because we believe, you know, without knowing the current debates, you know, you live in history. Like uh, when you learn uh, this uh, first sentence in uh, uh, Met uh, uh, Akkad, that there is truth. You know, uh, you have to uh, make the student uh, be aware of the current debates about truth and the claims of postmodernists about the truth. Then the students realize, wow, this is really important and relevant today. You know, otherwise he thinks, why do I learn this thing? You know, there is truth. Uh, you know, is it debated? Is there somebody who's objecting it? You know, uh, so we need to show how this is, you know, uh, relevant. Uh, today to the ongoing uh, debates and current uh, issues uh, today, inshallah. Uh, so we have to keep all of them together, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. That was the last question, actually, uh, for today. We went well over the, uh, than the allocated time for us. So we've got to close tonight. Uh, our next lecture and the last lecture on the series would be on uh, 4th of July, Monday on the topic of multiplex ethics and human rights. So we thank Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantu for delivering the lecture, and we thank you all uh, for taking part and making valuable contributions uh, in the discussion and Q&A. We are very much looking forward to seeing you in our next lecture as well. So with that, we are closing our lecture tonight. Uh, we hope to see you in the next lecture. Bye for now. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.